Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast, brought to you by Mitch Hall Chevrolet in Haskell, Texas, where I get all of my vehicles. This is the world-famous Andy Shaver with the great Jeff Stanfield. <laughs> I'm trying to switch it up today. With Locally us, known. With us today from, I'm a guessing, Anoka, Minnesota, Brooklyn, Minnesota, somewhere around Game Fair, Mr. Sean Stahl with r and Sean, how are you doing? I'm great, man. And that intro is awesome. Like, that wad of lessers, like, it just... I hunted down there one time in Haskell with Justin and uh, that it was over a water deal. I mean, I just, it sticks right to you, man. That's cool. It's crazy. I mean, and, uh, you know what, we got this footage back this, that, that clip's probably 15 years old. And, uh, like you said, it was just a massive tornado finishes perfect. And the shooting was horrendous on it. Like, you would figure the bottom would just fall out, and not like it's maybe four or five. What it's do- bad. Uh, what dog is screaming? Is that Bear or was that Lou? No, it's Bear. Before Lou, then that was Bear. Yeah, that was a Dane Raymolt hunt. He's an Elysian, Minnesota kid, and hunted. He was down here for seven or eight years, and uh, he had a dog named Bear, and Bear was ready to to go because we just finished a tornado and shot. He had five birds to retrieve after, after, out of a thousand. That for- Isn't it funny how when that happens, people come out and they're pointing and you're like, no, right. low, low, low. Yeah. The yeah. low birds never get shot. Yep. That's funny that you were talking no. about Justin. Me and Ju- I, me and Justin are good friends. Justin Healy owns Ranger Creek Goose Guy. Yep. He's a competitor. And we've got our, a new kid that works for us, Hunter LeBlanc. Great kid. Me, me, Tony, and Andy, or me, me, Tony, and Hunter went to Home Depot in Abilene today and picked up some stuff. We're doing some, getting a project finished here. And we went today, and I talked to Justin on the phone for probably 20, 25 minutes on the way. And when I got off the phone, I told Hunter, I said, he goes, is that a guy that hunts by us? I said, that's our biggest competitor we have. And he goes, you guys are friends. I said, yeah, we are real good friends. So we talk all the time. I said, it's a shame that all outfitters can't get along with the people that they work with and around like we do. It would make life so much easier for outfitters because you're not competing so much against each other as you're helping each other out. Because there are times that I'm going to be in a bind this season, and I'm going to need Justin. And there's times this year that Justin's going to be in a bind, and he's going to need us. So we work good together. But Justin's a great guy, good friend of ours. You know, and I think it's funny that people like from the outside looking in, or even the younger crowd, crowd in the industry, they think we all are at each other's throats all the time. And like, it's such a small industry, and in, in like call makers and decoys. Like this is my third weekend in a row, uh, different circus, but same monkeys, man. We're, we're, that we all get along, hang out together, and you know people see you at night like hanging out in a bar or a restaurant, and you're with, you know, the such and such company and call maker, and you're chumming it up, and people are looking like, man, shouldn't you guys be not? No, it's just it's too small, and we're here to make a living doing what we like to do. So you know, before the podcast, I didn't really realize how small it was. We had our little we had our little section of Texas that, you know, we hunted in and, uh, starting the podcast and, you know, go into these shows. And like you said, like it's, you hang out with the, you see these people commingling with these people and these people with those. And you're like, wait a second, this, this doesn't make sense. And I didn't see that part until we started the podcast. Cause I didn't go to, I didn't go mm-hmm. to game fair and I didn't go to Delta and, you know, I wasn't hanging out with anybody like that. So I was, we were kind of, I, no, I mean, it, it- it kind of got that way a little bit towards the tail end of my uh, calling career when, you know, it, when I was contest calling, it was pretty much Tim Grounds and everybody blew Tim Grounds. And then you had foils and you had a couple other call makers. And then it almost turned into, you know, you had to flash gang signs and wear your colors in the, in the bullpen, man. You had to sit with these and all that. And I caught some flack for it, you know, because I wasn't sitting with my crew and I'm like, look, like, I was friends with these people before all this stuff. I'm friends. I'm going to stay friends with them. I'm going to talk to whoever I want to talk to. And 
you know, I was good friends with Kelly Powers and we kind of run around and even though I was blown for a different call maker, but yeah, it's, it's pretty when wild. When was that? The two thousands? Yeah. Yeah. Right around 2000. You, you, yep. got, you had to, you had to make sure you were in the right click. Oh yeah. Walk, walking into yep. that prison yep. courtyard. Make sure yep. you had your, make sure you're yep. ready. You to catch go. somebody in the parking lot. You better watch out. You might get shanked. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, at, at Delta, was that, was Delta last week? Two weeks, weeks ago. Two weeks ago on what Friday night we went to the Fred's to Fred's. I saw you at Fred's, Sean. And, and that was that was and wild. We could, we, that was pretty dang. We could not hear each other. Everybody <laughs> that's in the waterfowl industry was there just about. I mean, there was mm-hmm. everybody from every walk of life, but like you said, there was probably ten different call makers there. There was every clothing company. Everyone was there at that event. And it was just a who's yeah. who if you're in the waterfowl of walking around and talking to other people in the industry. It was really a neat deal. And, and like you said, it, I've been in this business about as long as anybody I know has. And I never went to all that stuff. And I didn't really care about it. I wasn't a big industry guy anyways. But I didn't realize how tight the industry people are until, like Andy said, we got into this. And and you still have your alliances on certain companies and certain things that you do that nobody else does, but you're nice to the person that's selling something else. There's not a big, there, it, there's not a bunch it, of hatred. Could, well, you definitely don't want to burn a lot of bridges in your life no. that you may eventually have to cross back over. And as a small as industry, this is, I, I mean, I've been in it long enough to 20, almost 25 years now that people will go to work for this company and then this company and back and forth, you know, it just, you don't want to burn bridges and, and try to get back over them. So it's just as easy just to be nice. Yeah. Being nice is not hard to people. I mean, it really isn't. You wouldn't figure. No. I mean, there are people that I have personal differences with that if they were on fire, I'd always say, I wouldn't stop and piss on them if they was on fire. I would just because of, I would never, it would haunt me too much not to, because I try to be a better person than that. But there are people I don't like in this industry, just like everybody else does. But if I see them, I'm going to shake their hand, say, hello, yeah. how are you doing? Good to see you again. Then I'm going to walk down the road and say, I can't stand that son of a bitch. But I'm going to be <laughs> nice to them. <laughs> yeah, just be a good Yeah, I know, it's just not hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. The Pacific yeah. guys are yeah. what just blew my mind, because they're friends with everybody. And I don't know what it is about Trevor, but like he'll, he'll go up to anybody and talk to them. Trevor Austin with Who's Trevor that? Austin with Pacific. I mean, oh, yeah. he's just he's yeah. just a social butterfly, and he'll yep. stop at booths yep. and yep. chum it up with anybody. Yeah, everybody thinks yep. everybody's you, competing to get that guy that's going to buy one call. What people don't realize is nobody owns one call, right? So, so oh, or decoys. Yeah. Holy cow! Like, where do all the duck calls, goose calls, and decoys go that people buy? I I gave fifteen hundred old silhouettes away couple of years ago really mm-hmm. wow. to a local guy yeah but it seems like you're right though like every it seems like every year somebody's got a new call out and every year people are buying them all the time yeah anybody's looking for the new bread slasher how about the uh at delta did you get inundated with any uh huntresses and influencers and all that oh, stuff boy what a topic that is i was just having i was just <laughs> having this conversation with uh, a friend of mine cousin of mine it's a it's a it's a weird time that we're in you know elaborate a little bit because i agree but well it just so he he had a he had a pretty high job with a, a big organization and toward the tail end of his career they were pushing all their chips toward these huntresses a big one that i won't name and he's like people are not tuning in to see what she's using they're tuning in to look at her in a bikini like they're not going to take they're not going to buy whatever product because her name is attached to it. And anyway, he went on and did his own thing with that after that, but it's just it, it's weird who some of these companies are backing. But it it's not just the company. Look at the look at the world and how they get people to follow who they're going to vote for. Right. You know, uh you got rappers at you know at campaign events and drawing people in and it's it's anymore it's not what you know and what your the knowledge that you have that that should be the heroes and whatever you know that you look up to in life or in the sport or whatever it's more um what you look like or as a woman or uh 
you know, I, dude, you got sick edits, bro. Right. Nice pictures, content, you know, uh, not to mention they probably don't know how to blow a call. They probably been hunting for about two years and they've got 50,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. That's the, you know, uh, we've got young people looking up to that and it just makes zero sense to me when you've got uh, people that have a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge to, to offer, but they're not being followed and they're not they're not, they're not the true influencers. That's right. Yeah. It's all, it's all sucks. the metric on Instagram is what it is. It's if, if you've got this, people will roll out the red carpet and you can almost name your price with some of these companies. I want my influencer to have some yeah. kind of knowledge in his head of what he's talking about, or her. Anybody. Yes. Yeah. Whoever I'm dealing with, that's an influencer. Mm -hmm. I want him to have a little skin in the game and I'm not talking about own a big company. I'm talking about, know what they're talking about. Cause we've had a couple of them on with us that absolutely are clueless when it comes to hunting. Mm -hmm. You can tell it's all about the IG and Facebook and whatever else is going to be X, whatever Twitter, but have no clue about what they're talking about. I want someone to come on that's knowledgeable that can explain to me why they're doing something. And, uh, I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a yeah. shout out to a kid that worked for us for one year, Thomas Hoke. Mm -hmm. Thomas does one man videos. He goes right. out in a kayak and he goes and hunts and he goes, he might be in North Dakota. He might be in the river in Indiana or Virginia. And I don't even know his, his IG deal, but I'm, I'm, I'm follow him on IG, but Thomas works his butt off and he's slowly getting up the deal. Now, if Thomas looked like Pam Anderson, right. He would have 10 million followers, right? Thomas is not the best caller in the world. He's not the best hunter in the world, but he bust his butt to make his own content. That is a true person that if someone wants to follow to really watch, if you hunt on your own, people like him, there's a lot of them out there. But those guys never get the attention that the mm -hmm. pretty ladies get. Yeah. You said his name's Thomas. Thomas, Hope. Thomas Hope. He'll, be, he'll be at Game Fair. He works for uh, awesome. Corey. Yeah, Corey Lucas. Uh, no, no, not, not Corey. Corey Lucas. Corey Loeffler. Death Row. Oh. Death Row. Death Row. Yeah. Corey Loeffler. He Corey. works for him. Oh, he's going to be there. Yeah. Now, Thomas. Thomas. I have, have to stop by and talk. I, I'd i rather have 10 Thomases than one $50,000 or 50,000 follower Some, glamorous it, looking. Yes. And I mean, whenever you, and uh, boy, we're going to catch a lot of hate from this just because. No, we're not. We're going to get more people on our well, side than are against it. People. People are, people are sensitive right yeah, now. I, don't care I mean, and, and like this is this is the way this is the way of the world, and I understand that this is the way that this is the trend that we're in. It's all about Instagram followers, and I mean that's kind of how long. How long do you think that those will they'll last? Because I don't I don't feel like that the people that are in this sport for the f fame and glory of having Instagram followers are are truly in it for the same reasons that. We were, we grew up and we're in it now because we love the outdoors. Right. I think that once the cool factor wears off, I think they're on to the next uh, the next thing to try to um, feed. It, it comes down to narcissism, basically. Um, you know, the next thing to feed their ego. I think this is an exaggerated version of the pile picture days that we saw probably 10 years ago. You know, for a long time, it was how big of a pile picture could you get? And that's really all that you cared about. I think this is just a step, a step further than that. And it's, it's to the, to the good looking, uh, people of this world with a, with a big follower, but yeah, you're right. I mean, if you look at some of these people, you know, their hunts, they're always on a, a cherry hunt or most of the time they're on a cherry hunt. Like Jeff was talking about Thomas, he's mostly a public land guy. So he's hunting public land most of the time and he's going to go out and he's going to shoot five or six ducks. And that's all you're going to see. Uh, a lot of these people that have these big Instagram followings, they get invited all over the nation. So a lot of times they're hunting the cherry cherry hole, and you know they're gonna have they're gonna have good pile picks and good content, and they've got a team around them. But <clears throat> I can think of one person that was a big influencer in the fishing world about five or six years ago. Nothing now, you know what I mean? It's just you grow up and get married and have a couple kids and. You quit wearing a bikini and nobody really gives a shit about you anymore. Yeah, your fun bags are never right. everybody, not everybody's looking yeah. at your fun bags all the time. Right. But it's mm -hmm. just like I said, it is it's it's where we're at in this industry. Is it right? Is it wrong? You know, I don't necessarily agree with it. I wish that uh I just I don't see it as a long term uh step or to to stay in the industry. No. No, it's for most people. No, it's not. And you know, I mean 
kind of wants that to because other than other than taking sick photos and having a bikini on you don't have anything for longevity to get you to the next well, it's level just like that hawk to a girl that took the internet by storm like what's her long-term play you know she was drunk on broadway in nashville she, she, i don't think she's gonna need it she's getting like 30 grand a, a appearance right, right but now. some of that you know she was at a concert not too long ago when she did her hawk to a thing on stage and like nobody applauded nobody did anything and mm -hmm. i mean it's just you mm -hmm. can't replicate that. It was a it was a flash in the pan. You said something funny. It took the internet the life by storm. Expectancy is, is, I mean, and now yeah, the life expectancy is low. If she starts a podcast, I mean, what is she gonna what's she gonna say of, of substance? You know what I mean? It's just there's nothing past that, that one moment. So a lot of people are, are chasing something that's probably gonna elude them in another year or two or three or four. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, she's her, her deal's done where she screwed up. And if it was my granddaughter and someone told her that I'd want to slap him upside the head. She screwed up by not doing an only fans. She didn't have to get naked. Just put a bikini yeah. on and, but she would have had enough followers. She'd make a couple million bucks in those three, in these last three months, she could do one today and she wouldn't have that kind of fanfare. So that's where she messed up. She did not capitalize on it like she should have, but I think she's done. I don't. I, I think within three months, by Christmas time, we won't even know who she was. Right. I think her her train has left the station, and there's another one going to come down the road, and there's going to be something else. There's a mm -hmm. woman that uh, at a, some kind of event though that a sporting event a couple weeks ago flashed her boobs, mm -hmm. and someone found out who she was, and she's getting all these followers now. And I don't remember if she was at a, I guess a baseball game or something. Well, I saw today that girl that got in that fight at that Morgan Wallen concert in the porta potty. She's working at Playboy now. There you go. So they yeah. ain't got a fucking avenue. I don't want to hear no more shit about women's rights and lib and shit. My fat ass. <laughs> you I can, can come, you I, can have all the green heads you want around your yeah. neck, and you're not you're not gonna bust a thousand likes. I can walk in any waterfowl <laughs> event in the world, and people know who I am just about. But they ain't none of them gonna pay three dollars a month to look at me and fucking thong. <laughs> I mean, nobody is. So I'm gonna go broke and. I'm gonna end up starving. I'm gonna get skinny. Hey man, you don't know if you don't yeah, try. Well, I'm not right, gonna try. Yeah. Just, just throw it on there. You never know, Jeff. It could happen. I could shave the hair on my toes. I could give me a toe account or foot right. account. Yeah, but I uh, get so sick and. T I'm gonna start one for my toes. Yeah. <laughs> I get so sick and tired of hearing about women's rights and shit. They got more. If you get good looking, you put a bikini on. You opens up a lot of doors for you. I mean, yeah. You you talk about women's rights. I mean, they, now they're letting letting men fight women. Yeah. So yeah. do you see where yeah. do you see where the state of Massachusetts passed a law that you cannot use the term mother anymore? <laughs> now, women wow. can do anything a man How far how far are you going to push the the conservatives in a corner before they come I out just, fighting? Just, a, a woman can do anything she wants to do and she can do one thing that a man can't do and that's have a baby. A man can have sperm, spit, a booger, a turd come out of his body, but he can't have a baby come out of his body. I don't care how many times you try. It ain't going to happen. So being a mother is only something a mom can do. And it's crazy. And I saw where one of the other companies was going to quit saying feminine products. And it was going to, and it's going to say something like bleeding people instead of feminine products. That just blows my mind. A man ain't ever had a freaking period either. Perfect. I don't, it just, this world just blows. It just, I, could you imagine what someone that f stormed the beaches of Normandy would think if they could come back as a 20 year old today? They would be really depressed. Be I mean, it's just nuts. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. Thank God our industry has not been overtaken by all that stuff. The wokeness? Yes. Thank God. And mm -hmm. I don't think it ever will. I don't see how it could. I mean, I could see where, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't see how it could, but we're in a wacky time right now in the industry right now anyway. So. How many waterfowl companies will be in business in 50 years that are in business now? I'm going to say almost zero. What? What do you mean? The ones that are today? I'm talking about waterfowl industry people. I'm going to talk about the big boys to the small guys. I don't give a shit if you're talking about Bass Pro Shops to everything. Bass Pro Shops might be because of the fishing industry. But in 50 years from now, there will not be a hunting industry in our country, I don't think. Unless Why? We're, it's woke. They're already trying to phase it all out everywhere. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I hope I'm wrong, but I real. But what's woke? What's woke in our industry? Because we don't I, have I, I feel nobody. like if a company, if a company was was woke, they would get canceled in yeah. a hurry in our I'm, industry. I'm, I'm, like I'm not talking. Tomorrow. I'm not talking about in our industry wokeness. I'm talking about in society in general. 
where hunting is going to be looked down on. We don't have enough young people hunting anymore. I disagree. You're, no. You think we do have enough young people hunting? I don't. You're it's, Instagram's flooded with them. It's 18, 16, 18-year-old kids, but we don't have – if you would have went – We'll pick any town. We'll pick uh, uh, We'll pick where mm-hmm. Purdue is. Lafayette, Indiana. Never even been there, I don't think. Lafayette, Indiana. If you would have went to Lafayette, Indiana in 1955 and you'd have went to the high school and there was 300 boys in high school there, 200 of them or 250 of them had hunted or hunted with their dads or grandpas. Mm-hmm. If you go to Lafayette, Indiana now and they've got 300 kids, you're going to be lucky to have 15 kids that hunt probably or 30. We're losing the young people that are hunting. It's not politically respected like it used to be. And I'm really worried that 50 years from now, we're not going to have hunting anywhere. Hmm. And I hope I'm wrong. I've been saying on this podcast forever, the federal government is going to get the wrong president in one day, and they are going to take away all hunting on federal lands. Would we figure out that day? 28% of all the United States is property. Yes. That's a lot of land that you can't hunt on that you can access now. I don't know. That 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 seems like a stretch to me. I hope, it's just me personally. I hope, but I, I, I don't, hope I don't. that you're right and I am big time wrong. But I see the trend in this. Sean, you've been doing this for 25 years. In 25 years, the amount of places that you could get on to hunt that was easy access to today has completely changed. Now, a lot of it is due to hunters not being very respectful of people in North Dakota and South Dakota. Well, North Dakota, because South Dakota is all you have to draw. We haven't helped ourselves either. It only takes one bad hunter to do away with everything a hundred good hunters do. It is definitely getting harder and harder just to go to Canada, Manitoba. You got to put in for a draw, a seven day draw. Uh, Alberta's going to uh, two seven day licenses and there's talk that Saskatchewan's going to a 10 day next year. So it's already getting harder and harder for us to hunt. And then you take in and throw in, these agencies are starting to get move further and further left in their policies, and and it's it is definitely making it harder. You, you're in Arkansas all the time. Arkansas yeah. a couple of years a couple of years ago implemented that uh, certain property out of state people couldn't hunt on. Is it correct me if I'm wrong on this? Is that is that correct? I think it's certain days or a certain number of days, something like that. It's it's the um, the WMA, some of the WMAs, yeah. And, I, yeah. I understand where the, the Arkansas citizen wants it to be that way. I get that. They pay taxes year round. They get inundated. But with- you know, the problem, the problem with that is, is we turn on each other so much. Yes. And, and, and instead of we're, we're eliminating ourselves just as much as the left is. Yes, we do. We're not, we're not, yeah. we don't help ourselves. Yeah. We, we want to come out. We want to make these rules that are good for thee and not uh, good for me and not for thee. Instead of making, you know, making these hunting rules where um, you roll the ball out on the middle of the floor and everybody can play. No, it's it's I'm going to make these rules that are good, you know, good for certain parts of the um, the community or the the hunting public. Yeah, they they uh, that's a very good point. The hunter <clears throat> needs to find a way to help themselves. Get along with your fellow hunters, a good thing. But we also need to have guys that quit will sell out their grandma for a string of greenheads. There's a lot of guys out there that'll do that. They'll do anything, backstab, do anything they can, screw somebody over for that one morning of hunting. Right. It's just like the guy that mm-hmm. goes to Canada and the field's wet and crappy, but he's leaving the next day to get in a truck and drive to Pennsylvania. He's like, fuck it, I don't give a shit. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. He don't care if he ruts up crap. Then next year when he gets up there and the guy won't let him hunt, he doesn't understand why. Right. Yeah. yeah. Got to be good stewards. And I think, uh, I don't know, I think, I think we need to do a – I think it, it falls on us as waterfowl hunters to tell a better story. Um, I, I try to make a, it's a contents effort of mine to not just post pile pictures. I will if like my kids out there are a good friend or something like that and we have a good hunt. But, you know, I try to tell a better story rather than it just being about that pile picture at the end of the hunt. You know, what led you to be there? The the morning coffee, the sunrises, the uh So how much does, banter. How much does social media, YouTube, all that play into it? Because... I agree. Like, and I'm, I I feel the same way. Always present it the right way, the ethical way, uh, try to teach that. But the, the, the people are inundated with all the stuff on social media of people doing it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. 
to the point where it almost becomes acceptable to these people because they think that's the right way. Right. Well, that's what the, yeah, you're right. That's what they see. So that's what they, that's what they think is acceptable. Cause there's no standard. There's no standards in any of it. No, 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 no. There's no standards and there's no, um, you know, you need that, you need that old, you need young kids to buy into the, that story that the old man is telling. You know what I mean? And, and everybody's looking for the wow factor to go viral. Right. To, you know, what, what stupid thing can we do next? Yeah. Have you seen the video of that kid beating the shit out of the dog in the water? I know. I saw parts of that. Boy, that's turning into a. Evidently, he uh, got arrested. Yeah. I think he's only like 15 years old. Yeah. Him and uh, two or three buddies got arrested. And... 15 and they arrested him? Yeah. Well, at least it won't stick with him the rest of his life, and maybe he learned a lesson. Well, and then there was another guy. He's a dog trainer, and I don't know if he was at a hunt test or what, but it somebody took a video of him like across the pond, and he's just wailing on some poor dog that's just screaming. It, you know what? I fear that that whole dog training deal, like, yeah, that's that stuff was that was horrible, bad. But there's a lot of, like, you know, the collar conditioning stuff where if somebody didn't know what was going on and was watching that. Well, force fetching? Force fetching and understand, you know, that, that, that boy, we're, we're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. Some of that. I force fetch my yeah. dog that he passed away when we were at Delta. I force fetch him. And I mean, it broke my heart having to do that. It's hard, boy. Whew. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, he's. Yeah. But to the untrained person, you know, if, if we'd have had somebody in the road that didn't know what they were looking at, they'd have thought, mm -hmm. you know, you're pulling this poor dog's toenails out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's. Uh, education is a big thing tell you know we we have to do a better job of educating people and we have to do a better job of being role models and i don't like you said it's so hard for somebody for guys like us to break through on instagram or youtube or whatever it is just because of you know we're white we're middle-aged white men and it's hard for people to to you know want to follow that that old head or the old guy mm -hmm. and we just got to I don't know. Just keep doing what we're doing and pray to God that things change and that it takes it takes hold. And, it, you know, like I've always said, if, if if I can get people to follow me and, you know, the ones that want to be there and will do things the right way, like just it could be as simple as, like you said, just showing respect to the bird at the end of the hunt and making a good pile picture. You know what I mean? Instead of just having carnage everywhere, line it up and make it respectable, make a respectable picture we're moving in the right direction, I think. But yeah, I, tr I, you know, Powell pictures, it's always, a. uh, we get done with a hunt and, and I, it's, it's the last thing I, I want to do because I don't think that, you know, it just goes to that, that Instagram insta it, you're taking a snapshot of what happened and it doesn't tell the whole story. And I, I'm a big, I, I don't like posting pile pictures. I do it every now and then because those are the ones that seem to get the most uh, views and looked at. But um, that's the last thing in, that, that is, it's not reality. No. Uh, all the time. We have a rule here. You do not post pile pics. And, and, and my mm -hmm. reason is, I've got two reasons. My first reason is if we go take pile pics and we shove them all up and down social media and then you come on a hunt and we have a bad hunt, it doesn't look good. It's just, it doesn't help us any. Yeah. And so I don't like it. I would rather just post content pictures. Like if you got a picture of three mallard, three green heads sitting there and they got a little bit of ice or water on them or something, that's a good looking picture. You can put that anywhere in the world and that won't offend somebody. But you take 75 yep. geese or ducks upside down piled in front of a bunch of guys, uh, other than a hunter, it does not look good. Mm -hmm. Only a hunter gets off on that. Nobody else does. It's the same when you see a, an animal crappie flopping. If you shoot a deer and it's flopping and stuff around there on a video, you don't need to show that video. That does not help us at all with the non-hunter. The anti-hunters, they, they crave that stuff. So I don't care much for pile picks. I like content picks. But I'm going to tell you this because so, I'm a hypocrite. When me and Tony first started hunting in the mid early 90s, we went to a hunting show. The year before was our first year in business really full-time. We took we had a video camera, you know the ones you used to hold up by your eyes, the big old up camcorders. Look yeah. like a boom box. Yeah, it looked like a boom box. We had a camcorder and we would film. But yeah. the problem was whether it was me or Tony being a jackass, when the birds would get in to start shooting, they'd always put the camera down so they could shoot. Right. So we had to make a deal that we would not. So I'd have to take his gun away from him or him me so I wouldn't shoot. But we had a video about 15 minutes on a loop of us shooting birds in the decoys. 
five, 10, 50, 500 at a time coming in the most small candidates. We went to a first hunting show with that. Nobody had nothing like that. We didn't have it any, there wasn't no internet. I mean, there was internet, but there wasn't no Instagram or YouTube, but I could go to a hunting show and have that on camera. And I'd sell every hunt I had out within about two days just because of that video. So I'm a hypocrite on that. But today those things, it's different. Their videos are everywhere, but at that time they weren't very many of them out there. So I, I'm against the, any kind of big pictures of big groups of birds getting shot or to have pity pile picks. I, I just don't think you're helping yourself. I think you're making, I think you're setting your standards higher than they have to be. So the guy's coming in to hunt. Yes. I think that you're advertising something that's not going to happen every day. I don't care where you hunt at in the United States or Canada. There are good days and bad days. We went to Ooh. Canada last year and we had a day. We only, sh one morning we shot what? Three cranes. Yeah. A great time. But just as one of them mornings, it didn't work, you know? But, but if, but there's a, if you could do it right, there's a story in that, in that hunt. Like yes. we shot three cranes, but we all had a good, we had just as good a time yeah. because we got to cut up with everybody in the blind. You know what I mean? And people need to start selling the experience instead of just the, the outcome. I look back on my Instagram all last year. I posted three pile picks. One, we were in uh, Ontario with uh, St. Lawrence Outfitters. Had a great time there. Beautiful backdrop. That's why I posted that pile picture. And then the other two, I had my kid with me. And one of them uh, in there, I had my, my best friend and my kid. Those are the only three times I posted a pile picture last year. That's a pretty cool place up there with, with uh, Davey and Josh, oh, isn't goodness. it? Up there at St. Lawrence Outfitters. Oh. Yeah. Great gentleman. David is one of the best chefs I've ever eaten. I don't know if I call him a chef. He's a cook because I don't think he's a – he's not a chef. But he's a, he cooks as good as any chef I've ever been at in my lifetime. He cooked some, uh, was it walleye or smallmouth? We call Wall, it uh, yeah, walleye. Uh, we, we, fished walleye. The, we fished in St. Lawrence besides the hunting. And he cooked for us before we left to go to the airport. And we had walleye that had like a cream, Parmesan cream, maybe something on it. And then he had it fried. Oh. And my hat's off to him too, because like after entertaining, uh, after entertaining people all day, the last thing I want is them to be in my house and me have to cook for them. Never missed yeah, a Yeah, he's pretty good. Hey, super gentleman. Super highly recommend St. Lawrence Outfitters. Great guy. Very. Oh, 100%. Is good I've been good buddies with them forever. We, he made a, a snow goose confit with snow goose legs one time, and it was to die for. Really? It he's was. A, oh, it was so good. Snow goose legs. Oh, fresh, snow too. Snow goose legs. He I is, never mm -hmm. put that together. He was a wonderful yeah, cook yeah. and a great host. What, yeah. a, what a great guy. So what, what do we got? We did a. Go ahead. We did a cookout there one time. It was just a, a bunch of different stuff. One guy brought a bunch of moose. We had moose stew. We had goose fajitas, uh, fresh tenderloins. Uh, a mutual friend of all of ours just shot a deer. He come there. We cut it right out there in a tree. And then uh, some guys from PEI brought 100 lobsters, cooked them things. Ooh. Davey darn near cut his finger off on that deal because they had a little assembly line coming off the where they were boiling them. And somebody put a... a he moved his hand in to put one down when somebody was chopping, and he had to go get that thing sewed back on one mm. night. Holy shit. That hurts mm -hmm. me. That makes me cringe thinking yeah. about it. I was in the parking lot at the, back when he used to run out of the Macintosh Hotel down there. <laughs> yeah. It's a world. Yeah. It, I mean, it really is. It's a it's a world-class place. Where all Is there anywhere that you have not hunted yet for waterfowl? Me? Do you have a bucket list anymore? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get, I'd like to go to Montana. I've never been up to Montana. I did did everything else out in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I haven't done Arizona or New Mexico. That's kind of cool. Where I really haven't done that's always been on my bucket list is the Eastern Shore. Just not, I just haven't done it. Um, I only went out there twice to call uh, at the Worlds and just have never been out there to hunt maryland you know in the season they, they shut it down for a while and then they went to one bird and um just just never have done it hunted out you know new brunswick quebec ontario I pretty much i'd like to do alberta never done alberta but every other province that you could shoot one in um i've done hunted florida hunted destin florida I had dolphins swimming around that was pretty cool what'd you shoot in uh, destin redheads and teal well, we went for redheads, ended up shooting buffalo heads. The redheads <laughs> is just one of them. It's uh, you got to have the right conditions and go late. And we just it never got that way and it warmed back up. 
I never think so of Destin, Florida as a waterfowl hunting place. I know. I know. It's a funny deal is you set up there and you're out in the bay. You're just waiting in the bay. And they, uh, my Hunter Forbes, who we were down there hunting with, he lives there. And they get these palm fronds and they put them in the water. And, like, we go to stand behind them. And he's like, no, 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 no. You just stand right in front of them. And you got your spread of decoys. He's got this great big, you know, 30-foot bay boat behind us that we used parked like 40 yards behind us and it's a little foggy that day and we're sitting there and we're watching, looking through the fog and i heard behind us i heard hey you hey you out there are you are you okay and we kind of get out behind the blind and like what what and there's this little girl at the end of her dock and she thought the boat was like something happened to it, it was just floating around out there in, in the water and you're like right off, you know, when the fog lifts and you're you're like a hundred yards out in front of these million dollar homes, <laughs> standing in front of standing in front of palm fronds and shooting buffalo heads. So yeah, that's pretty wild. <laughs> I, t- I would like to hunt with Jeff Coates on the East Coast. I would love to go hunt with him and his. That boat. would be cool. And it's funny because be you know cool. Jeff and them they hunt in front of a lot of bays in front of big nice houses, casinos and, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you got you know Atlantic City's right behind you and you're shooting them or wherever they're at. It's just. That's a cool, that's just really that's cool. That's a humbling. Have you ever shot out of a big boat like that or a, or a boat? I have when I was in a wide I have when I was little, but not nothing like that. No. I always make yeah. fun of them guys and on it, his videos because they can't shoot. And then I'm, everybody, and Jeff even told me one time, he goes, this sucker's going up and down a bunch. So it, it depends on where you're sitting in the boat, obviously, how rough it is. And, you know, you sit in the back of the boat and, it's lights out. It's just, it's easy shooting. It's just like shooting out of an A-frame, right? Mm-hmm. Just uh, sitting down position. But if you're in the front of the boat the next day and you're all like high and mighty from the day before, and your buddy up front was missing and you get up there and you're just well, <laughs> doing this deal. It's it's pretty humbling. It'll, it'll get you, especially in some heavy seas. Now, you said you only went to Easton twice? Yeah, I, I went out there. So... Calling in the, the contest circuit that summer, I was doing, I think I I won like half of, I, I think I called in like 16 contests that summer, and I think I won a something like that. And Sean Mann, who I always looked up to, Sean Mann and Tim Grounds, and he was traveling around, he's like, man, you got to come out, you got to come out. And I, I just, it's always in November, and that's when the honker hunting's good at home, and I just never came out. And so I went out there that year, um, and I won. And then I had to come back the next year because I won the year before and I ended up getting fifth. And then I just, I never went back to call. I went back out there a few times to judge, but never back to call. So, I mean, you know, you win, you win your, your first time out there, you're in the top five the yeah. next time. And it's just the honker yep. hunting's too good at home for you to want to, for you to want to compete. Like, why, I just why, never, did, why didn't like, you try to, you know, cap, you know, go for three? I, I just never met like, it's cool that I won it and it helped open a lot of doors. Um, but contest calling for me was never like when I first started out and it was like, you know, I seen Sean Mann on TV and then Tim grounds was in some of them outlaw videos. And uh, I, I, I just like, man, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to be able to sound just like them. And then, you know, so I got into contest calling and, you know, originally it was like, man, I want to beat them. And you know this, but honestly, I mean, you, you beat them, in a contest, but it doesn't mean you're a better caller than them. Uh, it means five people sitting behind a, a, a screen thought you were better that day. And I, I got into contest calling because I wanted to become a better caller, uh, not because I wanted a bunch of uh, trophies and accolades. And I wanted something to do in the off season, get out, meet people, network, you know, hunt around the country, that kind of thing. And when it's hunting season, I just, I'd rather be hunting. Right. How, how far has how far has contest calling progressed since when you were calling? Because I mean, it's, it's some of the the series that these guys put together, like Robbie Iverson at, at uh, whenever I, I listen to his routine from Squad Fest. I mean, it's just it's crazy the notes that these guys are stringing together now. Yeah, he's throwing it together. It's it's come a little ways, you know. I mean, you're always trying to set yourself above everybody else so they're coming up with new notes and new strings and whatnot uh by and large i think the some of the kelly powers the field hot nose i i think they're always like if they wanted to get back into it i think they they could figure it out pretty quick and their style 
would still win. Like Field, you know, up until a couple of years ago, was still blowing the same routine. He was similar style routine that he was blowing back in the, you know, early 2000s, uh, and he's still winning. Uh, it comes down to sounding like a goose, having power, volume, c- you know, control, and don't make a mistake. Um, those are the things that everybody strives to get. And I mean, you go to a contest, and there's usually two or three people that stick out um, that have all that. Right. So I don't think I don't think it's changed a whole lot. Um, I think that, that they've gotten cleaner and and their flows a little better. Duck calling, I don't think has changed a whole lot at all because that's so structured in their routine and what they, a Main Street style routine, what they can and can't do. Yeah. Now, when you won in 2000, were you expecting it? <clears throat> I mean, obviously, you know, the cliche answer is, yeah, I was up there to win. Uh, but I mean, being it, having it be your first time to Easton, like, you kind of had to be like, holy shit, I'm going uh, to do this. I probably, I probably should have put more effort into it. I mean, I honestly, you know, at the time I was blowing, uh, for hunting, I was blowing a, um, I had a Tim Grounds half breed. And then for contest calling, I was blowing a modified, it was basically a snow goose insert in a straight meat honker, um, with, with a set of clucker with an old set of broken clucker guts in it. And I've been hunting since September all the way to November, whatever it was when I left for the airport. And I, hell, I couldn't even find my dang, my contest call. So I didn't even blow my contest call until, um, I was driving to the airport actually, and up until that point, I didn't know where it was. And I was just thinking, well, hell, I'll just borrow one from somebody <laughs> at the contest and blow that. And I, th- I looked at one last place and it was in my glove box in my truck on the way to the airport. I literally blew two routines in the parking lot at the hotel. And if you blow contest calls, a, a contest goose call is, is a lot stiffer. It takes a lot more air, has a lot more range than, say, a half breed because it's real. I mean, just doesn't take a whole lot of air to put in it. So your the muscles in, in your mouth aren't built up enough for a contest call. I blew two routines, and I got air leaking out and everything. I, said, well, I better not do this <laughs> anymore. So I went in and blew two rounds, and the way Easton works, you blow two rounds on Friday night, and then they take the top five and go to Saturday night. So I blew those two rounds um and got in the top five and i had a chance to go see duck hunting the next day uh with a a couple of guys and i I turned that down because of the con you know the i wanted to keep my head in the game for for the contest that night and then i blew in the finals and thank god there was no ties because i couldn't uh, i couldn't have blew another routine and then they got down to the end and it was it it came down to between me and and freddie and you know there's the back then at the the arena was the auditorium was full. There was probably three, 400 people in there and, you know, got down to Ohio versus Michigan and, and people in the crowd, you know, Michigan, Ohio, Michigan, Ohio. And then they announced second place Clayton, you know, from Clayton, Ohio, Fred Zink. And I was like, wow, I mean, this is, this is pretty cool. Did it. Yeah. It just kind of, it happened so fast. Yeah. And then on a plane the next day, headed home to go hunting. I talked to Kyle Jones. He was out here a couple of years ago with die bomb and, um, when he was working for them, he mm-hmm. said the acoustics in that, in that auditorium are just, you get goosebumps whenever you hear, whenever you hear the contest callers. Oh yeah. I, I got goosebumps talking about it there. And that was always, that that's a, another thing that the, just a subtlety of contest calling that a lot of people didn't know then, or still don't know today is that different rooms reverberate sound differently. And John A. Logan down in Southern Illinois was the same way where like goose callers tend to uh, turn around, do circles and throw their sounds and let it roll off the walls and bounce Peoria. Uh, when they used to have that contest in Peoria, uh, that was the same way that room would roll. And then as the room filled up with people, it would deaden sound. And so you kind of learn to do different things. And Kelly powers and I always worked together. Um, we were each other's kind of biggest fans and, and critics. And we would, before the contest would, you know, would start we jump up there one person would get in the the judges booth one person would get on stage you call throw your sound around and then critique each other tell each other okay do, you know don't turn this way come this way do that and then we'd swap you know swap back and forth on that and then same thing with like outside uh inside you want like a, a deeper mellower 
tone that's just going to roll, that's got a lot of bass in it. And outside, like up here at Game Fair, if you try to blow that same call up in Game Fair, uh, tune the same way, the judges aren't even going to hear you. Right. Uh, because it's outside, it's in a tent, and you know the bodies and everything's eating up that sound. You got to have a, a, a sharper, uh, a sharper sound, and blow more at the judges the whole time. So there's a little game within the game. It's just not just sounding good. You got to make sure the people, you know, always. I used to get people in the crowd would say, "Well, we couldn't hear you. You didn't sound that great." Well, the judges heard me because I was calling the judges, not the right. people. It's the same way. You know, in the field, you're not calling your buddy, you know, at the end of the blind, you're calling the geese out, you know, that are coming in. Yeah, yeah you don't want that high piercing those are, those sound the in judges. the auditorium because that'll just pierce the judge's ears. It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, no, it, it'd ring too much. Yeah. Man, it's always a help. And I always get that. You said the air's leaking out the side of your mouth. I always get that early in mm -hmm. the year because, you know, I'm yeah. guilty of this. Could, especially on lessers. Yeah. I, I get it if I haven't went lesser hunting for a while. Lessers, and, and now we got a lot of specs here, so I'm constantly ripping on that mm -hmm. spec belly call, and I'm guilty. I don't pick up that spec call. Usually until the, the, the first morning. You know, when sun, when we can shoot is usually about the first time I pick up the spec belly call. And for a couple days, mm -hmm. you got that air just leaking out the side, and you're like, oh, my goodness, this is miserable. Mm -hmm. Miserable. Um you always feel, you know, kind of like you could have rode the, the short bus a little bit. You don't even, you know, you know, this call can make a sound, but you, by God, you can't get it to, to do what you want it to do. So, may, yeah. you know, I always say I'm going to pick up. Do you, do you think that has that lesser calling uh, what you're doing? Has that changed much through um, through the years? It used to be you could just make a whole bunch of racket. That's still it. And that's still it. It still yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. we get mostly uh, speckle bellies here now, but. I mean, the last couple times I hunted primarily lessers in Oklahoma, just throw a bunch of sh clucks at them and just make a bunch of racket and a bunch of, you know, flagging and shit like that. I'm still, I'm still waiting for somebody, and I haven't. I I need to sit down and do it or just play with it more. A true lesser call, like we use honker calls tuned high pitched. Yeah, but and some people are really good at it, uh, but. By and large, it still doesn't seem to really mimic them. Right. As far as um, tone? And, and just tone and pitch, yes. It's almost like like I do better a lot of times hunting lessers if I'm on a spec call and clucking mm -hmm. really hard. And and trying to do like like a a honker style cluck on a on a spec call. Huh. It seems to pick up better. Right. No, I haven't noticed that. Yeah. Um Last year, we had a really, really big group of Lesters do it, and I just told the the kid that was with me, he was from Michigan, and, you know, he's primarily a big honker hunter, and I'm like, just make as much noise as you can on that thing. Doesn't matter what you sound like, just cluck and cluck and just rip on it. Let her eat. Just let her, yeah. send Pour it. the coals to Send her. it, buddy. That's all you yeah. got to do right now. It worked. <laughs> you know, we finished them. But. Lessers, lessers are fun to hunt. You can get everybody active on those. Yeah. Yeah. And I... <clears throat> So, like I said, we've we've transitioned mainly to speckle belly hunting, and there's more. It seems to me there's more of an art in speckle belly hunting than there is with lessers. I mm -hmm. think they're so aggressive. Yeah, I really struggle at it. I think they're. I think yeah. lessers are so aggressive, and a lot of times there's so many of them they cannot wait to sit down and start eating. And I think you can use that to your advantage a lot of times. But I've noticed that there's more of an art to speckle belly hunting rather than shooting lessers. Yeah, that's definitely a weakness of mine. Specs. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm not around them enough. You know, we, we get into them in Oklahoma a little bit uh, and then in Arkansas. But yeah, I'm just, I, I don't spend enough time around them. So, how many years have you been to Game Fair? Well, I, I was trying to figure that out. Plus or minus a year, uh, 15 years minus COVID. So, I figure I've given about 30 weeks of my life up to Chuck, I guess. <laughs> I've I've been to I've yeah. been to Game Fair two different times. Me and Michelle went, I think in ninety seven, and then me and Andy went three years ago, two years ago? Three years ago, I think. Three years ago we went and it hadn't changed much. It's a great event. Uh -huh. It's a great time. It's it's too long, I think. Two weekends is a lot of time to be. And I only yeah. went one weekend both times. Do you see the same exact people two weekends in a row? Uh, no, no, no. Um 
there's a few, a handful that will come both weekends, but mostly no. Um, and you get like it's weird. You'll get a crowd, a crew of uh, coming from Canada will come down uh, one of the two weekends. The second weekend is the calling contest, so you see all the callers uh, on that one. Um, and then the, but I think you see the same. It seems like you see the same people every year, but not on the same weekends. No. I always wondered about that. How many of the people were double dipping and coming back the next week? It's it's a really neat event. Yeah. It's a dog friendly event. It's an unfriendly event. It's crazy because Minnesota has so many really cool outdoor people that love that and they appreciate the outdoors much. And I think it's a it's 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 a great event for them. You know what I miss about? Well, you look at. I think there's in there close to a hundred thousand waterfallers in the state of uh, Minnesota, and. I mean, they draw from probably four or five states easily around here. Oh, it's, it's a great event. There's no doubt about it. If it wasn't so far, I would have gone this year just to go. I wouldn't mind walking around. I want to have the corn again. That's the best corn in the whole world. That's, <laughs> it oh, jeez. I, I love that yeah. stuff. I bet I had three I bet I yeah. three different times I had corn while we were up there. That's all I had. I missed it. I never yeah. had the you corn. You didn't have it? Oh, it was one time. freaking great. No. Oh, man, that was good stuff. It's sweet corn season oh. right now. Oof. Yeah. I miss. Yeah. I, I must have missed the corn. So you were a half. You ran the half breed. That was my first call. That was my first big boy call. Oh, you know, I think it was ninety four. Outlaw did a video, and it was basically Tim. Is it Tim Cripe? Jim Cripe. He traveled around the country hunting with people that had them, and then he made a VHS tape. It was pretty crude, but uh, one of the people that he it was a ninety four one, yeah, and one of the people that he visited was Tim Grounds and they had him in the park down there and he did, he did his uh, guide's best, his variable tone honker and his half breed. And, you know, back then when a DVD come out or a VHS, mm-hmm. everybody, your buddies would get along, you sit there and watch it. And when we were, three of us uh, were sitting there watching it, one buddy or both the other two guys were like, man, that variable tone honker, that's awesome. That's, that's what we need. And I heard that half breed. I was like, no, no, no that's what we need because up until then i was they were blowing a big river and i was blowing a uh ken martin and an old 800 up until 1994 mm-hmm. and i got that thing and i picked it up and well it came in the mail i ordered it from knutson's and it came in the mail and i blew that thing and that was the first call that i that i bought and blew and i couldn't make it sound right that i didn't take it apart mm-hmm. Because every other one, it didn't sound right. I take it apart and try to monkey with it and make it right, right? Because it was the call, not me. Right. Yeah. Uh, obviously. But, but I sat down with that thing and I locked myself in the room until I figured out how to call on that thing. And that thing was just like it was almost like the the geese had never heard anything like it before. Yeah. I could be hunting the public ground at home and on that thing, and they could be going down the center of the refuge where everybody in the whole the whole. Uh, Every zone in the place could be calling at it, and I just picked that thing up, and they come right in the decoys. <laughs> that thing was just wild back then. But it was also one of them calls. Not everybody could blow or figure out how to blow right. Right. Well, you ought to have been me trying to learn how to blow that damn thing. <laughs> I had never blown a good a goose call that worth a shit anyways, and I never had to. The hunting here was so good. There was no pressure on the birds. If you hunted, And we hunted the X every day. So we're shooting a limit. I wish I had statistics of how many times we shot limits of birds, but I'm going to bet you 95% of the time we shot a limit of birds in the first 30 to 45 minutes. And 94, 95, 94, 96. 94, 95, done. It was just bam, 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 bam. I hired Brian Sullivan came to work for me, who was one of Tim's kids, basically. Mm-hmm. And Brian had, was a world champion on the pit deal, and he shows up. I didn't know you could make a goose call the sound the way Brian Sullivan did. I mean, (laughs) he wasn't honking on a fucking old PS20 or whatever the hell I had or whatever it was. He blew a call that sounded like a goose, a bunch of geese. And Brian brung me, Tony and my dad, all three a half-breed, all signed, and I've got them, all three signed half-breeds from Tim. And when I tried to blow that thing, (laughs) it didn't sound like Brian Sullivan blowing the thing. (laughs) It's absolutely (laughs) terrible. I never learned how to call one. But it was, it's crazy. You said Knutson's and half breed. And those are words I hadn't used many times in a long time. But that was the birth of what our business is in a lot of ways. I guess I don't know what a Knutson is. You you failed me as a father. It's a father figure. It was a magazine because we never had to buy it. We bought from Cabela's. But it was a newspaper. It was a newspaper. I bought my first flag from Knutson's. Oh. And that's that's where I got my flag. And I kept seeing it. And I thought, I'm going to buy one of them. It was like 20 bucks. So they sent me a Randy Bart's flag. 
And I, I remember, I'll tell you what, I pulled that sucker out. Of the I had it still in the wrapping. I didn't even take it out. And a buddy of mine, Matt Reagan, was with me in the spread. And he goes, what's that? I said, it's a flag. He goes, what do you do with it? I said, hey, you just flop that around. He goes, huh? I said, they say it works. I said, I'm just going to try this shit. It was like a magic wand. I felt like fucking Harry Potter. I pop that thing, and then fucking birds would just come right in. I was like, wow. And that, But I got that from Knutson's. That was a good company. They were, they were a Michigan company, aren't they? Yeah, Brooklyn. They're right over there by MIS Speedway. Yeah, and they uh they sold yep. waterfowl stuff. I met them in we met them in North Dakota. We were eating breakfast in uh that little Dawson Creek or something where we were eating that time at and them guys next to us, I started talking and they were Knutsons. They had a van that said Knutsons on it. Oh. And that's and I, I talked that. to that guy. Great, great people. But just it was before yeah. the internet come in and all the you didn't have direct. You couldn't buy from boss uh, or dive bomb. You had to go through to Cabela's. You had to go to a store. A Cabela's or a Bass Pro. It really wasn't. It really wasn't. I mean, back then, it, it'd be going even further back, all you really had was Herders and Knutsons. Oh, Herders. Another good that, company. Yeah, that was kind of, you get that Herders catalog. That was like, you know, when you got the Herders catalog and the Knutsons, uh newspaper deal, man, you waited for that. That was like the Bible coming for a waterfowler. I've got three. That's the only way you found out that new stuff was coming yep, out. Yeah. I've got three herders decoys in my main lodge in a P row boat that a buddy of mine built in 1980. And I've got three herders de goose decoys that we hunted over as a kid with my dad. And there's still pellets in there where we shot the decoys after dad. Don't shoot the fucking decoys. We still shoot them. But I have decoys that I hunted over. I'm going to say 78, 79 and 80 on Lake Wichita, outside of Wichita, with these floaters that my dad's, and I still have three of them in there, and they were herders. And some of the best floaters you could buy, the old styrofoam-looking ones, and, you know, they're, they're not built for for throwing around and stuff. You had to be careful with them. Boy, they were good They were good stuff. Now, I want to ask you a question real quick. Made me think of something. Is Dave Smith at Game Fair? Do Is Dave Smith at Game Fair? Is he up there? Does he have a booth up there? He, he, yes. They, well, I'm betting that Dave doesn't but, come, but Dave Smith decoys will probably. I, I want to, yeah. That Mallard looks really good that he's done. Did you see it? I, I'm going to go check it out. I, Brad say, Brad texted me a couple weeks ago and, and asked if, if I was going to be there and said he was coming. So, um, I don't know where they are. I haven't got around to making rounds yet. But that's a good looking decoys with the pictures of it. It's amazing looking. Which why would it not be? Everything he everything he makes is well. Wow, he's a horrible carver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wish he'd get a little bit better at that in his spare yeah, time. Yeah. Uh someday. Someday. Yeah, you know, he's, he's still got time. Um, I can remember those days. July rolls around and you get all those magazines. Cause like you said, that was the only way you knew if anything new was coming out that year. Is you open mm -hmm. that magazine and you go through every single page. Back, well, Max Prairie Wings was the first one that usually would come out. Yeah. That was the first one. And they've, I don't know how that little transition is going to go because they got it bought out by Bass Pro, and I think that's going to really hurt them. And it may not. It I don't may know. Not, but I don't know. I I, I, I don't know. I, I I think I don't think so. I, and I'm going to wait and see with it. Um, it, it that right there is a is a destination for waterfowl. It's kind of a mecca and. That means a lot to not just the Stuttgart community, but I think the water, the whole waterfall community in general. And I think, I think Johnny, um, and and I think he understands that. And I think I think they're probably going to do some pretty cool stuff there. I don't know for a fact, uh, but I see them putting putting in some money into the store and doing some things. I just want to see us have more avenues to get stuff, not just one or two. Mm -hmm. And and. I think that's one thing as the American public, we miss on everything. I mean, and I'm, I'm guilty of it as everybody. I buy, we get Amazon, UPS truck, truck comes to my house every day and it probably does yours and Andy's every day. You see, cause everybody buys from Amazon. It's just easy. So much is going to online and that's the, I still want to touch something. I want to see what it is, you know, and, and having a store like Max to go over to, you know, I'm down there all the time and it's just, it's right next door. Um, but I, I just think it's a destination that, that people need to see and go. Yeah, and and, and I'm like it's kind of like a waterfall mecca. I'm not a shopper, but if I am wanting to buy something, I go buy something. But I like to see what I'm getting. Um, one our mm -hmm. our newest sponsor that's coming on board here pretty quick, Bull and Briar Leather. They're building brick and mortar stores, just for I mean, so people could actually go in and see their goods that you're going to get. Because if you don't, if you buy something the first time from a company. 
you, you don't know what you're getting always. You think you know what you're getting, but once you buy something, like I buy, I get a lot of Columbia stuff. I know what I'm getting from Columbia, so I don't have to go touch it and feel it. But before I buy something the first time, I want to touch it and feel it. I bought a, there's a company called Poncho that advertises on everything now. And they got some cool shirts. Well, yeah. my friend Stacy Coker was wearing a Poncho shirt the other day and I liked it. Well, I bought me a couple and I hope they come in today. But I like, because does, I've touched it and felt it. Does Columbia still make hunting apparel? I, I don't buy anything hunting from them. I just buy shirts and uh, shorts yeah. and shoes. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got a bunch of fishing yeah. shirts and stuff from them. I just didn't know. I mean, because that was like back in the day when they come out with that four-in-one parka. Yes. That was the deal. I forgot. I mean, everybody said they had waterproof stuff until Columbia yeah. came I don't, out. I don't, I don't know if they do or not, but I get all of my shoes. All the shoes I wear in the summer are Columbia, and then about October I start wearing my shin, and I wear shin boots all when it's cold. But when it's summertime, I'm wearing Columbia shoes because they're comfortable to me. Mm -hmm. I'd forgotten Columbia had that jacket. Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of them in that Connex. No, I think you're right. Yeah. I'd forgotten all about that they were in the hunting game. I could open up a retro camo store right here in a Connex. <laughs> I've got all kinds of stuff stored. Just from the shit people have left. But yeah. The leave, the groups that leave people is amazing. How, why do you go waterfowl hunting and leave a bow and arrow? I had a guy leave a bow and arrows here one time. A thousand dollar set of shit on a waterfowl hunt. Did he ever call for it? Yeah, six months later. Oh. He's like, you know, I was looking for my bow the other day, and the last thing I remember was I put it under the bed in room seven. I said, I've got it still. Are you serious? I said, Yep. And so I, you know, I got it back. He came and picked it up. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna keep it by any means, but if it had been two or three years down the road, I might have sold the damn thing. Right. I had a guy leave a lanyard with some calls 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago. Two years ago, the guy comes in my office. He goes, I hunted with you, let's say, 10 years ago. And he goes, oh, it was a great hunt, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I left a lanyard here with a couple of calls on it. And he goes, I know it, you didn't, blah, blah. I had it sitting in my office on a call deal. I got all a bunch of antique calls and stuff. And I just took his lanyard and I set it on there. I thought it was one of my boy's calls, lanyards. He goes, that's my call. He goes, my grandpa gave me that call. Jeez. And he goes, what, what 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 can we do here? I go. What do you mean? What can we do here? He goes. Well, uh, th th those are my. I said. You can have your calls back. What, what, yeah, what are you going to charge me for my gonna, grandpa's calls? I'm not going to. They're near your calls. Luckily, I had just put them up there like two weeks before that, or they'd have been shoved mm. in an old Cabela's guide bag or something that I had a bunch of different land. I just happened to pull them out one day because one of the guides was asking me about a call, and I was like, I think that, that I've got one of those, and I pulled this lanyard out. It wasn't it, but it just happened to leave it there. I thought, well, it's a small world. Oh, shit. Well, you know how small you'd have to feel leaving your grandfather's call at a hunting camp and not call about it till like 10 or 15 years later? <laughs> I'm sure he probably didn't, wasn't going hunting again. He didn't think about it. The sentimental value alone. I, people don't take care of stuff. <laughs> no, they don't. And that's the problem you have. No. And then you got the other people that's complete opposite of that that overdo it on taking care of shit. That's probably me. That, you'll have things that'll last forever. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. That's you? How many times you clean your shotgun last year? I didn't shoot. How many times you clean it the year before? I didn't. I didn't shoot much. So your gun <laughs> hadn't been cleaned in three or four years. I didn't shoot enough. Is what you're saying? I've if it seen, were dirty, I, if it were if it were giving me an issue, I would clean it. But I'm not just gonna take Andy, it apart just to. I seen Mags clean your gun a hundred times up here. Yeah, he's good at it. He <laughs> yeah, loves <okay>. doing it. <laughs> I take care of my trailer and shit. I mm -hmm. sweep that thing out every single day. You, or you have the kid that's working for you. No, that's, you don't I ever have I, them. Here's my trick, Sean. I sweep the trailer out while everybody else is packing up. That's right. Work smarter, not harder. That's my, I throw all the bags out, and I say five dozen per bag stakes up, and I sweep it out, and they bring me bags back by about the time I get it swept out. So if I talk to any of the young guys, they're not going to say, you never pull seniority on any of them. I make them, yeah, they're bagging, <laughs> they're bagging the decoys up while I'm sweeping my trailer out, 100%. That's, I had a, that's seniority. I had a guy work for me about 25 years ago named Smokey Rathburn. I never thought I'd ever say his name on a podcast. But anyway, Smokey. Oh, wow. Do you remember Smokey? Yeah. The laziest man that ever worked here. Anyways, he would always go look for cripples while everybody picked up the shit. So as soon as the hunt was over, he'd get up <laughs> and smoke 17 cigarettes on the way to his truck, get to his truck, and dick around until everybody got all the shit pulled up. Then he'd pull in miraculously and never have found a crippled yet. Right. Was it, wasn't he into field trial dogs? I have. I, I don't have an idea what he was into. I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think he was. He was a Minnesota boy, wasn't he? Yes. I think. Yeah, I believe so. I don't so. know if they'll claim him. 
he's one of them guys. Speak, he's one of them the guys. Day. He's one of them guys on the side of the road that I said I wouldn't. Pee, I wouldn't have peed on, but I would have peed on him. So there you go. Yeah, I think he was buddies with uh, Randy Bart. Uh, him and Randy and they were, him and Randy were huh? acquaintances. I don't know if you could go as far to say they were really good friends. I don't know, but <laughs> Randy hunted with me yeah. some, and I don't ever remember Randy ever bringing him up or saying much about him. I when you. I first met Randy Bartz, he came up with Mike Ducart. Randy Bartz is a legend that the young people will never Ducart know. Ducart used to make used didn't Ducart used to make those illusion yep, illusion yeah. calls, calls. Now he's in the deer bit. Yeah, deer, has done very well in the deer business. Super super good dude. Really like Mike. But Mike and Randy came up and we we shot some footage from when they were first testing the uh, the layout blinds back in the day. But man, Randy Bartz, it was just a. He's a jewel of the waterfowl, and I'm so glad mm -hmm. I got to know him and be friends with him. I got a signed flag of his in there, and then one of probably the greatest waterfowl hunters that I ever had work for me was a gentleman named Dave Reese, who will be at Game Fair probably. And yeah, Dave, good friend. Dave's a yeah. super good dude. Meanwhile, Dave's taking over yep. Randy and them's the flag man company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. But uh, Randy Bartz was a very, very interesting man. And I'll tell you another really interesting man I had worked for me for a while was Ron Winicky. Did you yeah. ever know Ron? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Ron was another one that wasn't going to, um, what nobody was going to call him Flash. He moved pretty slow, <laughs> but he was. But <laughs> he, he had gout. I remember hunting with him. <laughs> I was probably 14 years old and uh, 14 or 15. I can't remember what year it was here. Anyway, I was in my teens and uh, <laughs> we were setting up decoys and he was like, I can't do this anymore. You got to, you got to, you got to take it from here. I, my gout's flaring up. So I, here I am <laughs> 14 years old, barking orders at a bunch of grown men on how to set up a decoy spread while Ron, while uh, Ron went and sat in the truck and goddamn gout was bothering him. Ron Winicky was one of the most talented callers ever. If he lived in today's modern era, Ron would be, uh, would be one of the most famous callers. He's, he was innovative yes. too. Yeah. He, he, you know, he tinkered. He, come out, he did that. Yeah. Come out with a goose chair. Yeah. Yeah, I gave him an idea and we were going to be millionaires on it. He told me I haven't got my check yet. I don't think you're going to. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. But Ron was a uh was a really interesting man. He he was, and he was a him and Randy Bartz were a lot of like. They were. They had more gadgets yeah, he, and shit than anybody I've ever been around. He turned a lot of calls for other call makers too. I actually I don't know, about six, eight years ago, I picked up one of his original Ganderlander goose flutes on eBay, and it was one that he actually hand-turned and signed it, and it was, I think, 1987 was the year on it. How much you pay for that? So I picked that up. It wasn't much. It was, I, I mean, I say that. It was It was under 100 I'll give bucks. you an extra 100 on top of it if you'll send it to me. I need that in my collection. Nope. I need to get a Winicky. That's why I don't have one of his. You've got the Ganderlander that Dave Reese sent you. I, I want the flute. Um, I want a flute to have also. I bet in you there. can find it on eBay right now. I um, mean, I'll, fuck, don't turn down the money, Sean. I mean, if, unless it's got sentimental value. But no, it it just means something. Yeah, I mean, that's me too. That's why I want one. Just I like yeah. Ron. Ron. I even got Ron. Ron did not work out with us because it was a younger man's game than he was. And whenever he, he got here, and he and he needed to be hundred and fifty pounds lighter, probably. <laughs> But I liked, I, but I enjoyed Ron. I liked him a lot. He worked one season for us, and when he left, I didn't have any any problems. But after the season was over, I was like, you know, I don't know if this will work out. And he was like, it's tough work. And so I got him a job uh, in our area with another outfitter that hunted just on water on a big ranch up here, and that's all they did. Well, Ron didn't last there very long because they wanted him to clean beds and clean rooms and do this, and that wasn't in Ron's forte. So Ron took his shit and went back to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. But he was a, I really, really liked Ron. God bless Ron. Rest in peace. He, he was a good dude. And um, mm -hmm. hell, he was the Nebraska uh, Citizen of the Year one year. You know, he won the Worlds in duck calling. He got to go to state capital. They had a Ron Winicky day and everything. <laughs> That's what we need, though. We were just talking about this. You know, we need, we need, we need some celebration around some guys that have some, some knowledge and some skin in this game. Well, Ron was very yeah. knowledgeable and a really good hunter. And so God bless Nebraska what, what, for doing that. What was his series called? Shoot him in the lips. Yep. He had, mm -hmm. he, him and Tommy Stutzman. Yep. And, and he had the old uh, boat that he had that he put on the Platte River that he'd, 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 he was telling me all about the food he made on it. Ron was an eater like me, so that we, we really had that in common. But he would cook these big breakfasts on this boat. And I just, I really liked him. And then, you know, that's, that's another good guy that we lost in this industry, him and Randy both. Yeah.
Is it crazy seeing how much gear has changed in the last 30 years of doing this? I mean, like we were talking about how the Columbia 4-in-1 jacket came and just revolutionized everything. And now, I mean, it. all the stuff's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not cold or wet anymore. At least not in tits. Plenty of options. I mean, yeah, it's just it's it's just crazy the 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 gear that is just so readily available. So who else? And being kind of, hey, look, like when when I first started, you had a pair of rubber waders, uninsulated. Right. Yeah. You know, and then then along come the uh, cam. They 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 put canvas on the outside of them. You couldn't even hardly move. And then 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 the neoprenes, and you thought you were wearing sweatpants. And now look at waders. You can. You can zip them down. It's like wearing a pair of bibs. Mm -hmm. You can zip them down to take a leak. And yeah. Oh, then Jeff was just talking it, about it, rubber waders the other day. Yeah. Yeah. How miserable that. I've never, I never did have oh, red ball. Yo, red ball. My dad, my, that's, I was just fixing to say red ball waders. My dad bought red ball. At the time, red ball waders were the best waders you could buy. The commercial fishermen were using them on the East Coast. And I remember my yeah. dad, it had to be in the late 70s. He paid 100 bucks for a pair of them. And his, you know, you could go to Gibson's, which was like our Walmart in Wichita Falls, and you could buy a set of waders for thirty dollars. Like, God damn, Ron, I can't believe you're spending a hundred bucks. All these things will last forever, ball. And they they probably lasted three years. Right. But there wasn't nothing like when I put them shin gears on now, it's like putting on a pair of sweatpants. They're so damn mm -hmm. comfortable. The boots are comfortable. It's it's easy to get in and out of. It's nice. Before that, if you would have told me four years ago that you was going to invite me to Arkansas to Stuttgart and hunt the nicest club in the world, but I was going to have to wait, is it wear waiters, I'd say no, thank you. I'll stick to my West. It's Texas hard to there. believe. It's hard to believe that 30, 40 years ago we could sit out and hunt for six hours. Yeah, and not freeze to death. Yeah, no, I mean it really is. Yeah, because you had you had a, you had two options. You could either be warm or you could be dry. Yeah. You couldn't put those two combos together most of the time, unless you just want to layer up and look like the kid on the Christmas story. We had snowmobile suits. I talked to this on podcast earlier that we had when we were little. And one time we went and did you have, did you have snowmobile boots or did you have moon boots? I think we had moon boots, I think is what we had, yeah. but we had, we had <laughs> these snowmobile suits that we hunted in and I don't know where my dad got them from, but he bought me and Tony both, and they were black, and they had these yellow fucking armbands that glowed in the dark <laughs> like a, a a tow truck driver would have. And we hunted, and it was the gear that it was so freaking cold. I mean, it was cold, cold, cold. Like, I think it was 81, maybe. So I was 13 years old. And I remember my dad, we got out to put out some decoys, and we had to break freaking ice in this hole. And my dad did all the work, and he cussing the whole time he's doing that shit. And we got the, we put out a dozen decoys or something. We didn't need very many decoys. And I remember he goes, now, guys, it's cold. We may not last long. He said, I hope y'all bundled up. And Tony goes, well, I'm wearing a snowmobile suit. He goes, well, you're wearing sweats under that and this and that. Tony said, no, I'm just wearing underwear. And Tony, <laughs> Tony unzipped it, and all he had on was a pair of Fruit of the Looms. My dad was so pissed at my mom. I told her, by God, to make sure y'all did. We hunted all morning, you know, and we shot our 100 shells and killed our 40 or 50 ducks, loaded up, went home. Nobody said a word. People were tougher back then, I think, too. I don't know that we were warmer. I, I think we were just tougher. Tougher or dumber? Well, we were definitely dumber. Yeah, both. But yeah. what was the coldest that you've hunted in? I, you can't take – you, but you can't take kids out and get them in the outdoors and expect them to like it like our parents did to us. We had nothing else to do. Like Too many other distractions. No, man. I remember, I remember going fishing with my grandparents as a kid, and you went all day. Like, they brought a loaf of bread, a thing of bologna – and some butter in a jug of water. You put a little butter on the bread and put some bologna on there, and that's what you ate. And if you got tired of fishing, you laid down on the bottom of the boat. My my youth was the same with my dad hunting. We would leave 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. We used to hunt this place called Miller's Creek that's over here. It used to hold a lot of ducks. It don't hold ducks like it used to. It used to have an old island out in the middle of it, and I don't know if they do or not, but we hunted there. We had a boat that my dad had built a cage on, a PVC pipe and we had burlap is what we used for a blind and clothespins. Mm -hmm. And we had three swivel seats in it. And we would take a black old fashioned lunch box that a guy would take to a construction site and to build the empire state building or some shit. And my, and we would have bologna bread. And, and usually we would have about a dozen hard boiled eggs and a 32 deal ounce deal of Coke. And my dad had would have a thermos of coffee. And we would hunt mm -hmm. until dark sometimes. And I was probably 10 years old and my brother was eight. We never quit. 
Andy, you got a 10 year old and a six year old. Could you take them 12 hours out on the lake like that? It'd be tough. Yeah. They would be bored. But to my defense, is Ron didn't have an option because I'm sure there were times that you guys were bitching and he would have loved to have had an iPhone to throw in y'all's face just to get y'all to quit, just to quit yapping. We had a transistor radio and we listened to college football on Saturdays and pro football on Sundays. Right. But I can remember like whenever I was growing up hunting. 12 years old, we always dug holes out here for the longest time, and I can remember dr- being so bored. Like, I'd pick up a, a stick, piece of peanut stubble, and I would draw on the side of the hole just to, I mean, because, you know, you got that you got that mid-morning wall when the birds are out feeding, and we'd always wait for the birds to go back to water. No cell phones back in the 90s, so it's like, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to pick up a stick, and you're going to draw little stick figures in the in the side of your hole till the birds start coming. One time our boat broke, the motor broke, we got uh, the water, the water pump went out on it. We hit a sandbar and me and my dad paddled. We had one paddle and I used my gun was the paddle. And we paddled three miles back to where the truck was. Oof. We got home about midnight that night. My mom was chewing on my poor dad's ass out there. No cell phone. No, no cell phone. And I did suggest when we went through Seymour, Texas and got a Allsup's burrito, there was a pay phone. I said, you think you ought to call mom and let her know? I did she'll bitch at me when I get home. I don't want to listen to her bitch what now. <laughs> and to know my dad, Andy can see my dad saying that. Yeah. When we got home at midnight, my mom was bitching and griping at him, but hell, we didn't care. He had to go home and clean 40 or 50 ducks still. Yeah. Those are great days, man. I'll tell you what, I was so blessed as a kid growing up. I didn't know it when I was younger, but when you get older, you realize how lucky you are. I, yeah, I mean, just think about, like, when I was 16 years old and started driving, I went to school every day, and I had a shotgun in the back and a bunch of decoys because I was going hunting after school. Yeah, just great life. And, and you can't do that today. I mean, I, I remember taking my shotgun in the, in the shop class to clean it one time. <laughs> no. Walking down the hallway with it in his case, you know. Yeah, you'd be tackled before you got in the front door now. Yeah, yeah I got a call from our school one time. The drug dog hit on Zach's pickup because he, he smelled alcohol, tobacco, and gunpowder. <laughs> and gunpowder. And and I think he probably hit yeah. Zach for two of the three. <laughs> but anyways. Yeah, in, in today's world, they'd have probably arrested about a dozen of us at school for having guns. You know, when when I first moved to Knox City, or we become part of the this the part of Knox city. So it would have been 97. Probably we gave a shotgun away from there to raffle for the booster club or something. We bought a shotgun and we gave it to the school and a kid that worked for me was 18 years old. And he took that shotgun to that football game and, and walked up there and the superintendent's like, we really shouldn't have guns up here. And I was like, I'll get over this shit ball. Could you imagine today Um. doing that? Because you were raffling off at the football game. We were just going to give the gun to whoever wanted the raffle. But the kid, Michael McGoy, carried the shotgun up there. Right. Just carried, walking around with the shotgun. You know, and. Different world, man. Oh, you do that shit now? Oh, Oh, God dang, it'd be terrible. You'd be all over the news. Oh, the cry closet would be full. Mm -hmm. Um, Was it, what was it like whenever, because, you know, you had mentioned watching all the videos and, you know, seeing Tim Grounds and all the legends. And then you became one of them. Was that kind of a surreal moment? Because, I mean, you've done everything in this industry. I I don't know. I guess I never looked at it that way. Um, I still look up to those people. So I I guess it, it everybody looks up to somebody. So I it, I don't know. Right. Don't have a good answer to that. Yeah. I mean, when you look at your when you look back at your career and all the things that you've done and the people that you've influenced and, you know, the hunters, the people that got into hunting because of Sean Stahl. I mean, that's got to be a proud moment whenever you look back on. Yeah. Um, I, yes. Yeah, I agree. Cause I think there's, there's people that when I think of it that way, I think, you know, I'd rather have people look up to me than some, you know, rapper thug dude, you know, and, and something like that. So, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's cool. Cause you know, like you said, you know, everything kind of came. Yeah, full it's circle. cool. Cause you, you know, you were yeah. one, one day you were a young man watching these videos and I'm sure you were thinking, man, if I could ever, you know, do what they do and travel to hunt and here you are. Yeah. And I always vowed to like, cause I remember how hard it was in the era that I grew up in to be able to learn. And I vowed to always help people out, you know, and, and take people out, whether it's young or old or new, uh, and getting them into the sport. Cause there's nothing more fulfilling because, I mean, 
we all have been on super great hunts. We're almost to the point where you're numb to a good hunt. Yeah. You don't really understand it. And it's nice to be able to take somebody new or somebody young that's never experienced it. Because honestly, I get more out of that than shooting a limit. Just seeing a young kid, the, the, the light come on. You know, this past February, we took a, a dad and a young kid out. Best hunt they've ever been on. And we didn't even shoot a limit. Mm. And this kid's ecstatic, man. He's, he's happy. He's just going on and on to his dad. His dad's texting me about it afterwards, how, you know, how much it meant to them and how, you know, uh, what this is going to mean to, you know, this kid in his life and doing all this. And you don't really realize that until you, you take a step back and look at it. And it's actually pretty cool. And that's one of the things I look forward to in hunts anymore mm -hmm. um, is getting new people out. Yeah. It's funny because I'm starting to see some of the same light bulbs go on in my oldest head. He picked up out of the blue, picked up, uh, picked up his lanyard a, a week ago, I guess. Sat out on the front porch and just started working on it. Mm, that's awesome. Just started working on it. That's awesome. And, I told him he could work at it yeah. this year. And I, I, I had kind of worked with him before a couple years past, and I was like, just you need to learn just a couple notes is all you need. You don't need to learn how to do all this crap. Like you got to build the foundation. And that's the big deal, man. When you're trying to teach kids or people in general to hunt, they, they pick it up and they just want to yeah. slow down. Let me just do the basics here. Stop them. Take and, and I teach them how to call without putting their hands on the end of it. Just hold it like a Coke bottle. Mm -hmm. Take away all of them things that they've, they've learned and teach them how to make one note. And then said, okay, when you do that 10 times, then send me a text, send me an email. And I'll tell you how to do the next one. And then just learn to walk and just, you know, put voice inflection in, then learn to put your your hands on the call, how that manipulates it. And in a week's time, boy, they can really get off rolling. Yeah, that's what he said it's, to me because I teach him the honk. And he's like, all right, Dad, like, I've got this. <laughs> what like what now and i'm like well <laughs> we'll work on it isn't it amazing how much faster they pick up on it than we do yeah Every it, i don't know if it's that that they pick up on it so fast or it's just like we know how much we struggled because i remember getting that half breed that 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 time i we went uh, the guide used to stay across the street from where we lived in knock city and i got to spend the night with the guides and it was johnny Reichert, dave reese Dave Gertz, I think, was there. Johnny Riker. I haven't heard that name in a while either. Johnny wow. Riker was the one that gave me the half breed. So I'm sitting there. I got all these uh -huh. guys that I idolize. I'm 12 or 13, probably, no, probably younger than that, probably 11 or 12. I was blowing an illusion goose call and got to spend the night because I was going to go hunting with, with Johnny or Dave the next day and spent the night on the couch and they brought out, Johnny had an old half breed in his bag, tuned it up for me and we worked on it there for, seemed like forever. And then I remember going home and just, I'm sure my parents hated any time because I would turn on the old Tim Grant. They gave me the Tim Grounds cassette tape that he that he did, and I listened to that thing. Oh on yeah, repeat. short read way. Yep, yeah. just that, and just worked on it, and just worked on it, and worked on it. Just for the record, yeah, I didn't mind you blowing a goose call in the front of our house. Our house was pretty spread out, so it wasn't that bad. That's a lot better than that damn recorder or whatever the hell you had in elementary that they that flute shit that you had to bring oh, home. I never had that. That was Zach. That God was Almighty, I'd be like, what was the purpose of those? Well, I I got drive your how to parents crazy. There's nothing oh. in life you're ever gonna do that you can fall back on the recorder lesson. I was like, listen, you got a you got a closet, get a chair and go close go in the closet, close the door, and then you can record all you want in there. But I did not want to hear that <laughs> shit no more. So the goose call did not bother. But our house was that way always. Michelle had to be a saint. Because the boys all blue goose calls all the time. And Andy and Zach, especially, especially Andy, Andy would work on it so much harder and he'd blow all the time. But that was just a normal sound around our house. Right. The, the, you know, them tuning their calls and everything. But you had a lot of great influences growing up, hunting oh, yeah. wise. I mean, yeah. that's, you've had you know, Ron Winicky, a world champion. You have Dave Reese, probably the greatest goose hunter that I've ever been around in my life. All the different guides, Brian, Matt Sullivan, all them guides. Smokey Rathburn. <laughs> I mean, you was around a lot of who's who's in the hunting business at that time. Yeah, yeah. And I was so proud when I finally got the double, when I finally course. got the double clock. I was so so proud of myself. And then, like you said, do it ten times and then move on. But it's fun. It's fun. I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to to working with my oldest because I didn't want to. I don't know. I didn't want to like push him into anything. I kind of wanted to let him find his passion naturally. And whenever he picked up that lanyard on his own, I was like, all right. Maybe maybe we did it right here. 
I told him a couple weeks ago, I said, Reese, you're going to work at the lodge this year. You're getting on the, if you can start working, making some money. Oh. I said, you can help in the back cleaning birds or you can, you can hunt and guide with your daddy if you want to. He's all thumbs. I don't know if I trust him with a knife. <laughs> but I told him, I said, you're old enough. You can start helping around here and make you some money. Yeah. And then you can start paying your own way on vacations instead of getting judges money all the time. <laughs> so that'd be good for me. Right. Mm-hmm. So where all are you hunting this year? Have you got the schedule? Uh, not yet. No. Um, I'm a little behind just because of the TV show stuff and, uh, all the added responsibility I have now that Jim's not there. So, um, got four, five weekends in a row of these shows, but probably end up in Manitoba, New Brunswick. Um, I've been going down to Oklahoma. I kind of want to skip that this year, maybe, uh, or do it a little bit different time. Maybe you head to North Dakota, do some kind of late season hawker stuff. Uh, and then I want to get the boat out uh, and get that out and start doing some. I've, I've really been getting into doing the water hunting the, out of the boat blind, just trying to. The field hunting's fun, but that's what we do all the time, and it just gets a little monotonous, and I want a little, little bit of something different to do. And ever since COVID, it's like, Everybody had a pickup with an A-frame and mm-hmm. five bags of silhouettes, and, and it just got tough, man, uh, to try to get on fields or find birds. So I've uh, been doing the water hunting, and that's been pretty cool. Yeah. So how does that work with the TV scheduling and everything? Are you in charge of where you're going to go, or is it a collaboration? I, I, I'm in charge of where I'm going, my storyline, and what I'm doing for my portion of it. John does his, um, and then I kind of help um produce all of it and then work with the editor and then i deal with the network and sponsors how is uh how has all that changed since you first started is it easier or harder uh the, the which part well like the sponsors and everything getting people all the uh, time. that's gotten that that's changed just in in the requirements for it you know because everything's so social media based right. now um you know, the content creation and that aspect, but, but for by and large, the, the, um, most of the sponsors still want us in TV. Um, uh, that seems to be the demographic, the demographics that watch that seems to be the ones that are spending the money, uh, the 35 to 55 year old range. Mm-hmm. So, um, but d- more than anything, it's just the, the social media aspect of it and the requirements is what's changed mostly in the, I think this is our 20th season we're filming for now at RNTV. How long have how long have you been with them? Has it been all was it 15? I uh, I think they did two seasons prior to me. I was doing the Fall Pursuit DVD series on my own uh, back when DVDs were still cool. Yeah. Um, most people don't even probably know what a DVD is anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, I think this is like 18 years that I've been on. Um, with Rich and Tone and doing R and TV, what a career! Mm-hmm. I mean, really, it's been fun. It's definitely been fun. It was a change of pace from what I was in before this, right? So. But I mean, just to think, like two decades, twenty, almost twenty years in anything. I mean, that's yeah, it's crazy. yeah, it's a, you know. But we were talking about it earlier with with social media and the influencers and all that. And I've always had this philosophy: you can have a little bit of fun for a long time, or a lot of fun for a short time, <laughs> right? And and, you know, you can re- live the rock star life and you're going to die the, the rock star way. Um, and just keep your head down. Keep going. Don't chase the latest trends, uh, the ebb and flows of things. Um, don't try to be like anybody else. Be yourself. Uh, people always want to know what you're doing and how you're doing it. So be um, be a teacher. Uh, try to be uh, a mentor and do things the right way and and don't try to just be yourself don't try to change just to be the latest greatest craze right. because those 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 are fat those fads fade away um, as fast as they come in so um, just just be true and I, I mean uh, the three of us in in whatever time we've had in the industry we've seen you know faces come and go um, but not many last a long time and and i love what i do uh, i don't want to jeopardize it and 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 ruin it um i want to do this till i retire yeah or die probably both at the same time <laughs> yeah not not a good 401k for a bunch of goose hunters <laughs> <laughs> nah. 
no, but it's it's a good it's a good living, a good comfortable living. You can carve it out, and uh, you know I may not be rich in the wallet, but I'm rich in memories and friendships. So, uh, in the end, um, that's life. That's going to be more. Yeah, that's that's the life right there. There's mm-hmm. a lot of miserable some bitches out there that have made a lot of money that yep. haven't done nothing they like to do. If you if you wake up in the morning and you've got a passion and you've got to figure a way to make a living doing it, or you get to do it a lot of times, that's what life's mm-hmm. about. I mean, we ain't here for right. We're, and this, we're you not know, here for a long time. It, no, we might as well have yep. fun doing it. And you know, and this this industry has allowed me to to travel around to meet a lot of a lot of faces and a lot of new places uh, that I wouldn't have I wouldn't have done. You know, in the career I was in before this. Yeah. Yep. No, and I, and you know, you got to be true to you because people people sense that. You know, if you're coming yeah. off as, as this fake, you're fake. Yeah, they they're coming gonna off, smell yeah. that and shit that's, a mile away. And and there's there's some of that in this industry too. You know, there's there's the the show person, and then there's the behind the scenes person, and and I think people see that, and I think that's the the thing that I always try. Like, I might be the biggest asshole in the world, but I'm the same person that you're gonna see walking down the. You know, I'm gonna be that same person walking down the street as I'm in a podcast or I'm on TV. Right. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. It, 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 it's very true. You got to You got to stay true to you. Well, listen, Sean, yep. it's been an hour and a half. We appreciate you coming on here. I know you're uh, up in, up in Minnesota and probably got, yeah, my phone was just ringing for dinner you plans. Got, We're you, trying to figure out if it's uh rockwoods boondocks or uh cowboy jacks. We, we went boondocks. to boondocks. Yeah. We, we went, went to boondocks. boondocks. Uh, oh yeah. They're having a, they're having a big party there tomorrow night. Somebody is. So yeah. and, and another industry, another industry party, have a good time. Eat some sweet corn from me. If you see Dave Reese, tell him I said hello. Cause I know he'll be there. Him and Steve both should be yeah, there. I'll, hey man, you better say a prayer for his kid. He's wild now. <laughs> he's up there. He's trying to, he's trying to be a Bronco or a bull rider. I saw rider. that the other he day, got, Benny. He got messed up, man. He got stepped on by a bull, but he said, he said, he's going to get back on it. He said, "You can't let him beat you." He's, he's, he's not gonna. He's gonna stay doing this until he rides that thing for eight his, seconds. His youngest boy sent me a message. He sends me a message sometime, and he, he wants to come to work. I said, "I'll tell you what, son. When you get out of high school, you got your job." Yeah. If he's ten percent the hunter his daddy is, he's ninety percent better than most everybody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and David's so a, he's good a damn good guy. If you yeah. see them, tell them I said hello. Thank you, Sean. We appreciate you. God bless you, my friend. If you ever make it down here, you come see us. Yeah, I know you said you're not probably not going to Oklahoma, but if you do find yourself down here, give us a ring and go shoot a, appreciate go shoot a it. well or something. All Thanks, right. Sean. Thanks, guys. Have fun. Talk to you later, Sean. Yep. Be safe up there. Bye. Right, bye. Interesting gentleman. Been He's around good. for a long time. He has. He stood the test of time. Yep. Follow your dreams, people. That longevity that a lot of people don't have in this industry. Nope. They come and go. You got to be very blessed to do it. All right. Thank you all for listening to us. Uh, Bailey Tolliver, not Bailey Tolliver. You have to take that part out. <laughs> Mitch Hall, Chevrolet and Haskell. Thank you. They sponsored this podcast. It's where I buy all my vehicles from. They got some great customer service. Check them out. Mitch Hall, Chevrolet and uh, Haskell, Tomorrow, Texas. you can find four new episodes of The First Family of Waterfowl. We are releasing episodes five, six, seven, and eight. And then two weeks after that, three weeks after that, September 3rd, I don't know, whatever that is. We will have the final four episodes. So head over to our YouTube channel right now. Get subscribed to it. Like it. That that way you don't miss anything. This will be eight episodes of season three of the First Family of Waterfowl. So go check that out. They're all up there. We love you. Hold Goodbye. on. Hold on. If you're if you're a football hold fan, on. if you're a football fan, the Big Honker Podcast Group on Facebook, or you follow me on Instagram or Andy on Instagram or this podcast on Instagram. We have a pick 'em contest we do every year, and we have a every, survivor pool yeah. every season. We do it. It's 20 bucks for each contest, how much winner takes all. Anyways, look it up on the Big Honker. Send me or Andy a message if you want to join. It's $20 for each one, 40 for both of them, and you do it. And it's it's a survivor. One's, survi- one's a survivor, so you pick one team each week, and if that team loses, you're out. And last and, person standing takes the pot. And believe it or not, it don't last very long. Uh, about five or six weeks is all it lasts. And then the other one is the pick'em contest like we do uh, during football season. Every game is there, and then you pick who you think is going to win that game. The person at the end of the year that has the most uh, correct guesses takes when, that whole pot. Yep, so that one runs all year long, the survivor pool. Uh, and then <clears throat> in years past, if – if it's a quick exit, which a couple of years ago, I think everybody's done like week three. Yeah, because they had a couple we'll, of big upsets right off. You only we'll pick a fire, team once. Yeah, you can only pick a team once. So you can only pick, if you think the Chiefs are going to win week one, that's the only time you can pick the Chiefs. But 
if it ends uh, early enough in the year, sometimes we will uh, make a second pool. I think so. it was last year that Detroit <clears throat> beat Kansas City in the first game. Right. And a season, lot of people went and out. wiped a bunch of people out right, right off the bat. But anyways, you can join. It's on Run Your Pool. It's great. Nate Cold Iron does it for us. It's a great thing we've done. It's probably our Lot fifth year we've done it. So Lot anyways, do it. A lot of shit talking. If you're not on the Facebook page, look up the Big Honker Podcast private page. It's a group. You have to do a deal. You have to answer a couple questions. Please join it. We'd love to have you. Check us out on all the IGs. Peace out. Love you. Bye. Watch for deer. Check out all of our great sponsors. Go check out Lucky Duck, Looking Glass Podcast. Head over to their Patreon. Get subscribed. Uh, Shin Gear, Dirty Duck Coffee, Dive Bomb Entry, Pacific Calls, promo code BHP, uh, BHP25, Boss Shot Shells, MLR Graphics, Mitch Hall Chevrolet, Mallard Bay, Ducks Unlimited, Double T British Kennels, Mossberg, Sample Outfitters, Hemp Hill Farm. We got a promo code there, BHP, and Alpha Outdoor Specialties. 